Today, on Locked On Phoenix Suns, we all have loved watching Olympic book in Paris, but how much of that can really translate to the Suns when he's the top dog once again? Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Brendan Clean, your host and a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons. Welcome in. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen to kick off your Friday. Welcome to August. The Olympics roll on. Hit follow or subscribe if you have not already. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube. So all you got to do is hit that button, get a new episode in your feed every single Monday through Friday during this season and beyond. Today's episode of Locked On Suns, we're talking Olympic book, how much of that can make an appearance in Phoenix, and a little bit of Tyus Jones, brought to you today by FanDuel. Make every moment more as the playoffs wind down. The sports aren't quite what we want them to be, but this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a booster or bonus daily. That's right. Something for everybody, every day, all summer long. So visit FanDuel.com to get started. Joining us as he does every single week is Stephen Perjon Garner, a writer over at Bright Side of the Sun and the All City Network. Stephen, give it to me right off the top here. When I say Olympic book in 2024, what does that mean to you? What have you seen from how Book's playing, his approach, his role? Why has he been so effective? Why does he keep being in this starting lineup and in this rotation, even as Steve Kerr moves the pieces around game by game? So when you get to a certain stratosphere, <clears throat> players are able to obviously play to their strengths. Naturally, being able to play to your strengths is the main reason why you're able to get to that stratosphere of athlete. Whatever you're – or honestly, you could take it from being an athlete and just apply it to any context of life. The best are the ones that are able to play to that particular strength, which typically is going to come naturally – but also are able to be adaptable within that. And not just be adaptable, but also be multifaceted within being adaptable. This, and I'm saying this because this is what we're seeing with Devin Booker. Devin Booker has the ability to be a top five, top six, top seven basketball player when he's at the peak of his superpowers. We've seen that in multiple playoff stretches and multiple series, even past just general playoff settings. Um, we've seen him do that. We've seen him uplift the Phoenix Suns. We've seen him punch above his proverbial weight class for people in terms of how they rank him in terms of players along the, the stratosphere of the NBA. What we're seeing with the FIBA Olympic right now is him putting his superpowers aside, buying into a specific role, and hitting on the margins in the way that this Team USA roster needs him to for all of their pieces to connect. That being him being arguably the next best defender on the perimeter for this team, exclusive uh, from uh, from Drew Holiday. Now, naturally, yes, you bring up Derek White, but Derek White hasn't been there for the entire time that this team has been together. Devin Booker has, and he's been getting a lot of the matchups on the on the perimeter in particular and doing a fairly solid job in, if not shutting off the water, disrupting rhythm, and really putting, def- putting opposing offenses at dismay at the inception of their possessions. And I think that's the first place to start with Devin Booker. Yeah, I guess it's not super different from what he was doing when, you know, he tweeted at Kyle Kuzma three years ago saying, like, I'll be the one to play a role. And we all kind of coined that name of Olympic book and everything else. He's doing a lot of the same things that I think we all expected. I guess I'm just interested because the players are so much better Maybe I guess what I'm saying is it was even more impressive the first time. This time, it's kind of like survival mode a little bit. Like, he might not be getting minutes if he wasn't willing to buy in, or he might not have made the team, you know? Like, so maybe that's just what it is. But, you know, I think what's impressed me the most is that a lot of these other players, not Holiday or White, I think they've just clicked in pretty perfectly. But whether you're talking about Tatum, who got the DNP, and everybody's Mm -hmm. been debating him and then I think Ant struggled a bit in the exhibitions to kind of 
find his spots and and when to take over when to attack versus kind of you know lay out a little bit and we've all talked about Embiid that way Curry's struggling now I guess it's just the seamlessness of it with book that really surprised me because I don't know I mean he's a really efficient player a pretty consistent player but I think we all would agree within the regular season in the NBA environment, he he can go through streaks. He'll be incredibly hot, and then he'll come back down to normal. He doesn't dip to bad ever, but like there is a high and low to him like there is with a lot of players, and the shooting, for instance, being part of that. I know that's kind of been the case in the Olympics, but maybe that's just kind of what happens when you do play more of a role and less is asked of you is it's easier to be consistent because the level of difficulty is a little lower. So... I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to, I, and we'll get to it, but like my mind always is just going back to the suns with it a little bit of like, how is this going to work out? Can it work out? Are there any things we can take from it? But again, we'll save that. But yeah, book has just been the consistency is what stuck out to me. Yeah. Yeah. The consistency is for sure. But the other like big thing within it, I think is the fact that he's relieved of a lot of the duties and usage that he has to take on when he's at the helm of the controls for the Suns. And naturally, some players kind of just fade to the backside and they don't really have another way to impact the game when they, A, don't have the ball in their hands consistently, B, don't have the ball in the spots that they're consistently used to having it in. Book has the ability to pivot from, okay, I don't have the ball in my hands. I'm not getting to my midi pull up. I can play off of closeouts. I have the IQ and processing speed to make plus one passes to connect things within the half court for the team if I'm not operating on the strong side of an action, which we saw in the handful of assists that he had in their most recent game against South Sudan. And then the other big thing is the defensive part. I keep coming back to it because his usage is as low as he's ever seen it in his, um, his professional basketball career. Finding ways to have an impact on the game external love i'm bringing the ball out the court i'm working in isolation i'm working in pick and roll and i'm getting into rescreens all of this stuff finding ways to put forth your energy in an impactful and efficient manner so your presence is still felt although albeit in a unique way i think that's extremely important i think some people have had questions about devin booker and his motor on defense sometimes or his ability to defend sometimes even now i laugh at that as well because i think that's that's it's uh, asinine to even kind of look at him from that lens. But, but it's I a good call it. because it, it, this is like the ultimate proof of how silly that is, right? Correct. Correct. And I understand it because for people that don't play basketball, it's not as easy as you think it is to have a plus 30% usage while also having to go and guard point guards in the NBA for 40 or 37, 38 minutes a game across 82 games, and now including the play-in tournament and then the playoffs after that. I don't know if people that don't play basketball understand how hard that is because these athletes are great, and the hardest position, I swear by it, to guard and play in the NBA is the guard position. <clears throat> the fact that he's able to balance that and, like I'm saying now, in a FIBA context, be able to apply that energy on defense, it really speaks to how if you're able to kind of even mitigate slight percentages on the margins of his usage – to where he can put forth that energy on defense, he can be not just an average defender, but a plus average defender and generally a plus defender when looking at box score metrics and things of that nature. We're seeing it with the, the little things with him in detail on defense, rim protection, screen navigation, shooting the gaps, contesting catches, you know, the denials. Like he's doing everything. It's not that he can't. It's just a matter of what is the capacity of energy he has, you know, to put forth on that end for me. Yeah. I'll say I think the the parts that have surprised me, the on-ball defense, not exactly like we've never seen it, but again, the consistency of it, the you know different types of players that he's been asked to guard, and again, just defense being such a chemistry-based thing, being able to be effective with new teammates and all that. I I, I would mm -hmm. I don't think like you're saying a lot of people think of him that way, and and it is another notch above. Um, you know, what he's been asked to do in the NBA. I think this year, one of the bigger things that I've noticed that would be different, even than the last Olympics from what I remember, and definitely from what he's ever really had to do in the NBA, is the offensive rebounding, which isn't like 
every single possession relentlessly, but there have been big flashes of it dating back through the exhibitions all the way into the Olympics mm-hmm. now. And that's been kind of cool just to watch him again, find other little ways to impact the game and commit to a game plan. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what you're saying, a lot of what, like, it's just embracing it and having it be number one on the job description that is impressive and cool to watch. But I almost wonder if, aside from some of the things that obviously he's added to his game over time, Maybe it's not even like Olympic book that should be the name, but it's almost a little bit of like dipping back into Kentucky book or rookie Mm -hmm. book, right? Mm -hmm. Like back when he was having to earn minutes, those, some of that stuff, playing team basketball on offense and just kind of his IQ and his smoothness and, and everything is, that's really what drew people to him as a recruit, as a draft pick as you know a rookie earning minutes over the course of that first season under jeff hornacek you know that that always was there it just maybe it's more like it's coming back rather than it's just showing up for the first time but let's talk about if it can stay here now that it has shown back up a little bit and he's been asked to do it when the season starts in phoenix we'll get to that question next First, today's show brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What makes a great team is also what keeps your number one ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance, whether that's a supercharger, roof rack, exhaust kit, LED headlights, or more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, Steven, so let me just put it to you exactly how I said it there. How much of this is transferable once he's back in Phoenix with the Suns roster in the Suns context? Keeping in mind, there's going to be a point guard here now. He still has probably the most talented roster he's ever played with, despite how disappointing last season was, and understanding some of what we know Mike Budenholzer wants to do and some of the pieces that did roll over, how they might fit into place. Is it just going to be wipe the memory, the hard drive clean in October and and get back to the hard part? Or are there things that he can plug into from what we've seen him do with Team USA that we might see this upcoming fall? I do think that he has a level that he can reach on defense and it kind of ties back into my initial point at the top of the, the top of the episode here. <clears throat> the fact that he'll have not just one, but two point guards on the roster to where across all of his minutes, if Mike Budenholzer decides to deploy it that way, he can always be paired with the point guard. I think that naturally and obviously most obviously that unlocks some off ball on offense, which is his most natural, you know, role on that side of the ball, operating as a scorer, first, second, and third. But I think, again, the big thing about it is when he can get back into that role, also defensively, he has just more energy to expand on that end of the floor. And I think when he does have that reserve, we've seen him We've seen him be really, really good on that end of the floor, doing a lot of the things on the margins. Uh, I, I look back to the 2022 first-round series against the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, that obviously he had Chris Paul in that series and obviously Kevin Durant as well. There were multiple stretches over the course of that, I believe, six-game series where Devin Booker looked like a top-10 defender in the league in the playoffs in that first round. And I don't think that that was by mistake. I think that when he has that marrying of, okay, my usage is not astronomically high. I have these pieces around me that can do things independent of me on offense to where I don't have to pull all the strings. There can quite literally be possessions where I might not touch the basketball, which is not a bad thing in case people didn't understand how basketball works. 
Look at Kevin Durant explaining that to you. Getting break on the court, especially in playoff context, is extremely important because then you're able to, you know, put forth yourself on the other side of the ball. I think those little things are important. So that being said, I think there are remnants of his usage and functionality with Team USA that can be transferred back to the Phoenix Suns in 2025 or 2024-25. And I would, I almost can put money on it that Mike Budenholzer has had conversations about Devin Booker having a certain level that he sees him being able to reach defensively and that this team's ceiling can't be reached without him reaching that level. Because if you look at the rest of the roster – and you look at the guard group and you kind of look at who's projected to be consistently in the rotation. How many of those players are blue collar in terms of you can bank on them every night to get scrappy, get their hands and feet dirty on the defensive end and do the little things that they need to allow for their defense to reach the level it needs to. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, I, I think part of it is like the ability to do it. Right. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that whether you're talking about Morris or Jones or Beal or Allen, those other guys, that they're not willing to commit to playing that way. But it's like, what's really the ceiling on it, given their size or mm -hmm. their injury history or their responsibility on offense or whatever, athleticism? Book has enough of the ingredients that, it's the same reason if I like rewind myself back to last year, I was sitting here making the case that the way the roster was built, the person, both, both, I guess him and, and Durant, but I think I agree with you a little bit more on the guards have it a little tougher than, than forwards in the modern NBA side of things. And I just looked at this roster and I'm like, they're asking too much of Devin Booker. He's supposed to be the point guard, the lead scorer and the point of attack defender. Like, what are we doing here? It's not going to work out. So I agree with you that this context should allow him to channel his effort and his energy. Um, and I've just been saying all along that as they built out this offseason, I think everybody's roles are going to be more clear and, and yep. defined and, and specific. So that should just roll over to him, obviously, too. But within that, because um, I agree, I think the defense is going to be the most translatable part. I mean, we can all talk about, you know, spot up threes and everything and and maybe there's something there uh of just getting comfortable with that shot mm -hmm. but the dude's a elite shooter i don't really think he needed a summer of reps to to get there um nah. it's really defense to me that that feels the most worthy of of exploring and last year we saw beal take a lot of the tougher matchups compared to book right like mm -hmm. the game where he guarded zion and countless examples of that do you think that's the same this year or do you think because book may have to have the ball in his hands less and be responsible for doing less on offense that bud might say all right book maybe not zion you know like that's a unique you kind of have to throw out your game plan and rewrite it when you're playing that guy but these bigger mm -hmm. wings do you think book guards more of them this year than beal does and more of them than a lot of those other guys we just went through in that guard wing rotation it is book that guy for them this year are oh, 1000 percent because when you add two point guards in addition to having Bradley Bill, Devin Booker, and Grayson Allen in your main rotation, that means you're going to be spending more than half of your minutes over the course of 48 minute games with three guard renditions on the floor. That's gonna task one of those guards with guarding somebody that might not be the typical matchup for them. It's not always gonna be with Bradley Bill on the floor that we're gonna see Devin Booker. So naturally, when Bradley Bill isn't on the floor, or even sometimes when he is. I am fully expecting to see Devin Booker taking on more of those matchups this season because you know for a fact it's not going to be Monte Morris or Tyus Jones that's going to be taking on those matchups. Not from the onset. Naturally, you get to switch in. Okay. But from the onset with the yeah, preferred yeah. matchups, you know, it's going to look a little different. And I think we will see Devin Booker taking on a lot more of those matchups. And quite honestly, I feel like it's appropriate because <clears throat> I have a strong belief that Teams are only going to be as good on the defensive end of the floor in terms of establishing identity and being consistent in a sustained manner on that end. They're only going to be as good as the best player on the roster is in terms of buy-in to the system and the uh, principles within the system and the general sense of urgency that that player is playing with on that end of the floor. If we see Devin Booker saving loose balls and diving into the third row um, courtside taking charges, sacrificing his body, jumping the passing lanes to initiate transition, catch contests, and the, leading the team in deflections. 
I keep harking back to that 2022 first round series. There's a barometer in terms of a baton that's picked up from every player that steps steps foot on the court. That's from the onset set by the best player on the team. When that player is playing like that, everybody else falls in the line. Everything is ratcheted up, and the team looks a lot like the team that they desire to be. So I feel like naturally it's best if he's falling in line with that. And I think naturally the way that the context of the roster has shifted, like you've uh, alluded to, I think that naturally puts him in a position to exude more of his leadership past just the vocal part and past just the offensive part. Yeah, to your point, that 2023 first round against the Clippers was an example. I would even say the times when this past regular season that they that we felt the best about them was the moments around January when Durant was putting on a defensive show mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then some of those times when Beal was doing it because I, I agree, I think it's a great point. Like the energy, the effort, the buy-in, it's easy to have a night where you score 130 because you just make a bunch of threes, especially in the league right now. But like mm -hmm. that other end is where I think it can be more galvanizing might be the best way to put it. So yep. I think that that is uh, that's absolutely going to be the case. And Booker has the tools to do it. We've seen it. And hopefully that balance that he's going to be able to have this year helps him get there. And I will Let's talk one about more quick thing. Yeah. One more quick yeah. thing. I don't think that the Suns in this rendition, as I've said in any other rendition since Chris Paul got to Phoenix, they can't be their best selves if Devin Booker is not the best player on the team. He has to be the best player, and he can't be the best player without being that above average, borderline, borderline elite level defender, if not for a sustained manner and the meaningful moments of games. He can't be that player for this team, and they can't reach their ceiling without him getting there. Yeah, I mean, you look at every team that's great in the league right now, they have two-way wings. Yep. That's the position that Devin Booker plays, whether it's convenient or not. You know what I mean? Like, So yep. mm -hmm. the idea that they can be an exception to that rule just because it would be nice if he didn't have to exert himself on defense. Like that's just not the reality of the situation. It's either teams that have point guards or bigs as their best player and a bunch of role players, high level role players around them, like the Knicks or something, or, mm -hmm. uh, or the Sixers, or it is the Celtics where your best player is a wing and they play both sides of the court and you win that way. So yeah, there's not really a version of winning right now where you have a, a scoring wing that doesn't do much else and i'm not trying to reduce book to that but they should be doing mm -hmm. everything in their power to make sure like you're saying as well he doesn't end up becoming that and and there's a lot of ways to go about that including getting a point guard which they went out and did twice this off season tyus jones was introduced this week the second to be added but the first on the depth chart so we'll react to his comments and Steven and I have not talked about the Tyus signing since it happened, so we'll get into what that all will mean for this upcoming season next. First, today's show brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more this summer, and yes, okay, the postseasons are over across sports. The Olympics are here. But sports aren't quite what we want them to be. However, FanDuel is letting you keep the sports going whenever you want. All year, all summer, all I have to do, all you have to do is open up the app, dream up bets anytime you're in the mood, and have some fun. And this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everybody every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. As soon as Steven and I are done recording, the women's national team will be playing. We have that to look forward to. Friday, Puerto Rico against the men's national team. The knockout rounds await. Of course, there's all sorts of other crazy sports. If you feel comfortable enough to think you're going to put your money on a sport or an athlete you haven't watched in four years, I am all in favor of that. I personally try to keep it to stuff that I actually have some level of opinion on. But hey, that's the fun of all of this. Baseball's back. Plenty going on. And before long, football and basketball right back in our lives like they should be. Enjoy it all. Check it out at FanDuel.com. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, Steven, we can do this pretty quick. Tyus Jones, officially a Phoenix Sun, surprising all of us. David Roddy, an Atlanta Hawk, EJ Liddell, gone before he ever could even 
I don't know. Is there a jersey out there? Maybe somebody <laughs> can get that as a collector's item, but he's gone as well. Um, Tyus had some comments. I wouldn't say on, on, on Wednesday, I wouldn't say anything super surprised me from what he said. It was a lot of what he said in the statement and the quotes to Woj that we already had seen. But honestly, my big takeaway from the fact of the press conference and everything is they clearly are rolling out the red carpet for him and making him feel appreciated that he is making the sacrifice he did financially to be here. You know, not every player, especially signed during the Olympics in the middle of the dead of summer when nothing's going on in the NBA, would even get a press conference like this, right? Would even have, uh, you know, any attention paid to them or anything like that. The fact that this all even happened and everybody seems to be so excited and Bud and Ishbia and all these people during their, Grace and Allen apparently during their vacation were like put, making calls. That's really what jumped out to me is like, it feels like, across this organization, there was a lot of buy-in and excitement about, hey, let's get this guy on our team. We all think he'll make us better. And that will go a long way, I think, once camp and, and the season come around to this thing gelling rather than different people having different opinions about it. Yeah, I think that that is extremely important. The fact that you can, first of all, entice a player, knowing that you don't have the means to facilitate in terms of being at a competitive disadvantage that other teams that he spoke to, which he quite literally spoke to <laughs> in his introductory yesterday or on Wednesday, rather. Um, he spoke to them, you know, okay, I understand the money might not necessarily be something that you all can provide, but what's unique about your situation in terms of the context, there's no better scenario across the league that fits my style of play. Opportunity wise, there's no other team in the league that can, we can just go ahead and say it that pretty much you pretty much wheel him in by saying that he's going to be able to start for you. No other team across the league that's in a contending realm can say that. And that leads me as a perfect segue into the last point being the fact that you are a contending team. There's proof of concept there with him in terms of the template of the team. He can envision himself in a particular role and that particular role helping amplify everything else and putting people in the perfect position to be their best selves, including himself and including his head coach as well. And I think that all of those little things from the inception point of conversations without having to literally be boots on the ground in terms of being in that scenario, being able to envision it and seeing it through to the finish line, which the ultimate goal is a championship for this team this season. I think all of those things really matter. That's the competitive advantage that the Suns have in terms of presenting a template for what could be to a player. Yep. And I don't think there's a better match in terms of the timing of Tyus Jones and his career, what the Phoenix Suns need with this roster at the moment, and what the ultimate goal is for both existing parties. And naturally, that presents you with the opportunity to make it happen. They pushed it across the finish line. Kudos to them for that. Now it's about putting the work in and making these pieces fit the way that they desire for them to. It almost reminds me of, in terms of the, the point the point in his career that he's at that you just hit on, is mm -hmm. the guys last year that I've spent all of this summer contrasting with. Last year it was mid-prime veterans, these dudes who have are at this point in their career where they've been good on bad teams, can they be good on good teams and fill a role? And the mm -hmm. answer on a lot of them was no, but it's mm -hmm. kind of similar with Tyus, where obviously he's been good on good teams he was in memphis for a lot of years where that team was winning tons of regular season games and punching above their weight in the playoffs and i've pointed out mm -hmm. this week since they signed him he was a much bigger part of that than i think he gets credit for he would play with jaw in the playoffs a lot and everything yes. else but it's like mm -hmm. can he start on a team that wants to win a championship that is a step up for him even though he's made a lot more money than a jordan goodwin who we were all talking about last summer the opportunity and the prove it mentality is a little bit similar given that he just so happened to end up in situations when he in washington where he when he did finally feel like he was ready to prove it where that team started tanking right as he got there now it it, it can be kind of the the best of both worlds where he's not a backup anymore, but he's also on a good team. What can happen? And obviously, it'll be a a win-win, I think. Well, might be a little bit of a lose for the Suns if they end up losing him. But they'll take an awesome season from him this year if that ultimately means that he leaves next year because they'll only be able to offer him like $3.5 million or something, and he probably will say no if he has a good year. 
Um, but I just want to reinforce too on the court to pass it back to you, how much when you talk about style of play and what I would imagine a lot of what he is thinking and a lot of what Bud is thinking about his fit, how stark the difference can be with him orchestrating this whole thing from a pace standpoint. I've said multiple times this week too that for the past five years of Tyus Jones' career, every offense he's played with has been a top 10 offensive pace team. The Suns were 17th last year, and for the most part of the season, they were way lower than that. It kind of surged at the end of the season. They were also, in terms of points per transition play, they were 7th, but they only tried to score in transition. Their frequency was bottom 10 in the NBA, and especially off of misses, they were bottom 5 in frequency. So they scored decently. You would hope they have talent to score points no matter what the context is, but they just never ran. So even if you just told me Tyus made spot up threes and helped their transition effectiveness and sense of purpose when they wanted to play fast and of course cleaned up the turnovers, even if that's all that he did and he had a season just the same in line with every other season he's ever had and there was no big breakout moment, holy crap, this guy's even better than we thought, that's going to go such a long way to making this team better. And that is exactly why I feel like it's a match made in heaven for him in context with the team and why the context, fit, role, and opportunity for him matches where he is in his career. He doesn't have to do anything different than he's done his entire career. And him being in streamline with everything that he's become as a basketball player, assist turnover king, efficient playmaker, decision maker, being able to play off the ball, 43% on 176 or so catch and shoot opportunities being a connective piece when he doesn't have the ball in his hands and getting the ball where it needs to be in a point five mentality. All of those little things, it's just why it's just such a match for him to be with this team. And I do think that there's a lot to be had in that because when things hit, when adversity hits over the course of games, whether that be via injury or just clutch games, you know that you have a player that has a certain level that he can reach to where you know he's always going to do this which is for him, not turn the ball over, put people in position to make plays and be their best selves, and also score on efficiency when he does have the ball and advantages created by him or from others. And I think that having that and like a master organizing type of piece, you can, come, you can harken back to Chris Paul for that. It's going to look a lot different because it's, they're not even close to the exact same type of player, but they have similarities in dynamic that I feel like are very, very important to optimizing what the Suns have. Them being able to find that and for Tyus to be able to play to that role, no different than he has at any point in his career, but to be as as well insulated to optimize the things that he brings to the table, I think is as important as anything. And that's why I just feel like it's just a match. And I feel like there's no way for it to not work. The only way, the only way you could dub it as not working is if they don't reach the championship, which you could say about 29 other teams every season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like I, I, I made the case for it on Wednesday in the context of I kind of combined KD's Twitter chatter about offense, uh, about random offense, and then can that work with the point guard? What Bud's role in all of it? Just kind of trying to wrap my mind around how they're going to play and all the change that they're going to undergo on that end of the floor. And somebody commented on YouTube, which I thought was a, a very fair point of, well, so you're telling me he's just going to, you know, initiate an offense quickly, dump it off, set the play in motion and then go spot up somewhere and he's going to be undersized on the defensive end and it's like yeah i mean that's what i'm saying but also nobody's saying he's going to play 40 minutes a night nobody's saying yes he might have been promised a starting role but i don't think he's going to be coming in here thinking he's going to close 82 games or you know why why would anyone promise him that so mm -hmm. yeah he's going to be one of the pieces that this team brought in to try to improve itself and he's good enough that he's more than deserving of starting and playing a lot of minutes we'll see from there but again the guy's making 3.3 .3 million dollars and he's significantly better than any of the other choices that you had to do that maybe no better emphasized by the fact that this morning on thursday Gordon Hayward, who a lot of you guys might have been talking about as an option, retired. So, like, that should illustrate there probably wasn't going to be much better than this. So, they'll they'll do their best with it. He's not going to be a surefire ring just because he signed with the team. But, like, we'll see. And it there's a lot more reasons to be excited about it than down about it. And he picked here. So, obviously, he feels the same way.
All right, that'll wrap us up. Check Steven out over at PHNX, CHGO, and Bright Side of the Sun. Hit subscribe or follow here if you haven't already. We'll be back next week. Trying to get a guest lined up for Wednesday, which means no solo episodes of me. You're welcome. More <laughs> Suns chatter across the whole world of this team and the whole world of the globe with the Paris Olympics ongoing. Enjoy your weekend. I'll catch you guys next week.